Inside Vision is brought to you by New England College of Optometry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of Inside Vision. I'm Dr. Howard Purcell, and along with my cohort, Eric Lilligren, we're happy to bring you this week's program, Optometry, Decision-Making in a Public Health Crisis. Thank you again for joining us. Hard to believe that this is our 11th week on the air with you, and we thank you for your continued support. Uh, on behalf of uh, my cohort, Eric Lilligren. Eric, are you out there? Do we see you yet? There he is. On behalf of Eric and I, we yes. want to thank you much for joining us for the past 11 weeks. It's been really a lot of fun for us, and we have another great show today. Eric, I know you're out there in Ridgefield, New Jersey. How are things going on out Ridgewood. there? Tell us Ridgewood, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Ridgewood, New no, Jersey. It's personal. It's, personal. it's my hometown. <laughs> I better get that right then, that's for sure. Hey, it's good to see yeah, you, buddy. I know, I know you've been continuing to travel around the country, and uh, tell us what's going on there in your hometown. Are things starting to open up? Um, I know there's some differences between different businesses. Tell us about what you're seeing out there. Yeah, it's really interesting, Howard. It's great to be back with you, and it's great to be in my hometown. I, uh, you know, As you know, I've been on the road since uh, May 3rd. And I, I did check in here uh, two other times until now, um, but after a trip through um, Texas and up to uh, Oklahoma, uh, I was finishing work in uh, Oklahoma on Saturday and then got home for Father's Day. I have two daughters uh, and a wife here in New Jersey and I uh, needed to see them all. And uh, we, uh, you know, we had a great Sunday and now I'm here Monday, Tuesday looking at... Um, you know what's happening in New Jersey, which is so foreign to me now, even though it's my hometown. Uh, I've been in the South where things are open, and it's it's just a different world. It's like coming back and forth between two different worlds. Uh, you know, and you have a lot of uh, you know angst and anxiety here that I notice is not uh, as prevalent in the South. You have a lot of concern about uh, you know the economy here, the uh, the, the restaurants, the small businesses are struggling. I'm sitting in front of a movie theater that I've that I've, uh, you know, come to for most of my life here. And the message on the marquee is, you know, not about a movie, uh, but it's about, you know, the closure. And, uh, you know, and specifically, it's interesting to me that it doesn't say closed for COVID-19, but it's closed by executive order. There's a lot of sentiment here just about, you know, who's making decisions and why and, uh, you know, the irregularity of guidelines, you know, relative to parties or gatherings, et cetera. So, I, you know, I think it's apropos to our discussion today about, you know, public health and, uh, you know, how to manage it at optometry, but then also in the, in the world at large and the relationship between public health and uh, business and, and people's general lives. Yeah, you're so right, Eric. And thank you for bringing us, you know, throughout these 11 weeks some really good, um, you know, direct uh, relationships with some of these people out in the field. I know it's been very helpful. We've had a lot of really positive feedback. By the way, before we go any further, I know you and I both want to say thank you to so many people who reached out to us after last, last week's show. It was probably the most feedback we've received from any show we've done. Nothing to do with you not being with us last week, Eric. Ha ha ha. No, I just kidding, buddy. <laughs> The TV guys didn't allow me to uh, converse with you last week. We got a first picture of me, but so, so, so. No, we did miss you. We did miss you. We know technology works that way sometimes. But I do want to say thank you to so many people who reached out to us uh, after last week's show, thanking us, appreciating it, and just amazing guests. Uh, Dr. Glover and Dr. Ramsey were outstanding. Uh, they continue to do great work. I do want people to know, because our guests we're about to introduce are both from New England College of Optometry as well, that the college has signed up to join them on their 13% challenge. So I encourage our listeners to look into more about what the 13% challenge is about. We're excited about it. It's a lofty goal, uh, but we have to set high goals for ourselves and uh, otherwise we'll never have a chance of getting there. But I do want to thank everybody for the kind words and the, the feedback we received from last week's show. You know, we are obviously now keenly aware of the consequences of public health crises and uh, we're very fortunate today, Eric, as you know, to have uh, uh, two guests with us that are among optometrists in somewhat very unique ways. Uh, they've decided to take that extra leap and, and really formally educate themselves on public health and the issues and solutions. And I think uh, no two better guests for us today to really help us uh, understand those issues. So I'd like to welcome uh, to Inside Vision, Dr. Diane Russo and Dr. Gary Chu. Um, Diane, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you. Uh, 
Dr. Russo is an associate professor of optometry at the New England College of Optometry, where she's an instructor of record for courses ranging from public health to patient care. She's an attending optometrist at Codman Square Health Center. Uh, our school is very proud to be part of many of the community health centers in our area, and uh, Dr. Russo does a wonderful job at one of those. She got her BS at uh, Quinnipiac University in 2006, and her OD degree from some school in New York. I hear there's an optometry school there somewhere. <laughs> and that was in 2010. Uh, after graduation, uh, she completed a residency in primary care and low vision at the West Haven VA Medical Center. She also got her master's in public health, which is what we're hoping to pick her brain on a little bit today, uh, from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health in 2017. And in 2019, we're very proud of her. Uh, she received the ASCO's uh, Rising Star Award. In 2010, she was named one of Vision Monday's most influential women in optical. So welcome, Diane. We're really happy to have you here. Look forward to hearing from you. So thanks a lot for spending some time with us this morning. Thanks for having me. You bet. Also joining us, uh, my good buddy, Dr. Gary Chu. Uh, if you've been watching any education that's been going on over these past three months, you've seen Gary, you know the contribution he's continued to make uh, in trying to educate all of us. Uh, Gary is Vice President of Professional Affairs at the New England College of Optometry. He did get his doctorate degree from NECO in 1995 and his master's in public health in 2002, also from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, Dr. Chu has been in the forefront of leading change in eye care through the development of partnerships in health systems, federally qualified health centers, social service agencies, government, school systems, health payers, the ophthalmic industry, and optometry employer groups. Gary pretty much engages with all of the parties within our profession and does an amazing job in doing that. He's been involved and very involved in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion for over 10 years and has served on the Diversity and Cultural Competency Committee for ASCO since 2011. He's the founding chair of ASCO's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion SIG. And Gary, we thank you for that. You've been out in front of this for many, many years. You've been uh, someone who's really been a true advocate. And in addition to your expertise in public health, we appreciate your passion for issues that obviously are critically important and even more so today than ever before. So welcome to Inside Vision, Gary. Thank you for having me. You bet. So uh, where do we start? There's so much we'd like to know from you guys, but maybe Diane, if you could just kick it off. Uh, you, know, you know, very few of us have gone through a master's in public health program, and uh, I'm sure that in many ways it influences how you look at things. So maybe you could start off with what are some of the more important things you learned as uh, going through the program and perhaps how it's Im impacted you as a clinician and a practitioner? Yeah, that's a great question. As I was thinking about this, the, the curriculum is very broad in public health, um, but my focus was on health policy. And so I think there's really probably three topics, topical areas that I keep coming back to, and that's in sort of my daily life in, in clinical practice, but then also working with students. So one is the importance of data and the quality of your data. and um, understanding the actual accurate story that's being told. Uh, statistics, I know Gary and I were teaching our public he health class yesterday and we talked to our students, statistics, epidemiology is not intuitive. Uh, things that you think you can rationalize with common sense actually tend to be incorrect. Uh, and so having a, a deeper level of understanding of data is critical. Um, Social determinants of health was a topic that I had never heard of uh, leading up into my MPH program. And that's something that, you know, I've become very passionate about. We've incorporated that into the public health course. I've given CE lectures on it. Um, and that is focusing on the environments where our patients live, um, spend their time and work, live, worship, um, in, integrate activities into their lives and how that impacts their health outcomes. And so I think that is something that is directly correlated to our clinical practice, being aware of these social determinants and how they impact our patients' lives and their health outcomes, their ability to come for follow-up appointments, their access to care. Uh, and then lastly, I would say my understanding of the U.S. healthcare system has had a significant impact on um, the way I view the practice of optometry. The conversations that I have with my patients now are very forthright about what insurance they have, what cover it, what that covers, potential barriers um, to obtaining pharmaceuticals, 
what their deductible might be, co-pays. You know, I know a lot of optometrists maybe don't like to discuss price. Uh, that I hear that time and time again. I once said that same thing to myself. But if we don't have those conversations, then that becomes the barrier to our patient accessing care. So across the board, those three things have have weighed most heavily, I think, on my perspective. Well, obviously, three very important things. You know, you mentioned something, Diane. I'm going to go a little rogue on you here for a minute, if you don't mind. But you mentioned that you and Gary teach, uh, teach the course on, um, on public health. Um, because not mo many of us have a chance to do a master's in public health. Could you give our listeners just an idea? What are you teaching in public health to the optometrists today? What are they going to leave optometry school having some at least general understandings as it relates to public health? It, you okay trying mm -hmm. to address that one, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Yes, we uh, re, uh, redid some of the curriculum more recently, so I'm very familiar with that. So um, Gary had been teaching the class long before you know I, I came to NECO, and, and the structure of the course was in two parts. The first part is foundational. We cover topics like epidemiology, um, cultural competency, uh, healthcare reform in the U.S., and um, now we also cover social determinants of health. And... Um, that foundational piece is largely the same. It covers, it's a superficial overview because those are, I mean, very heavy topics in and of themselves, but it gives a basic introduction. And then the second half of the course is what has changed. It used to be largely around poster projects. So, you know, Gary, and I may be taking the words out of his mouth, very often says, you know, I can't just teach you public health, you have to experience it. So at the time, students were going out doing projects, and then uh, there would be poster presentations that the students would be involved in, which was great. Um, but I think at this point now, the curriculum has now evolved, and the second half of the course will be public health and clinical practice. So creating direct parallels to the foundational knowledge that they learn in the first part of the course, um, and how that looks when you're actually talking about patient care. So we'll have a more case-based method where we will present a case and then sort of tease out the public health principles that are at play and, and go into to a deeper dive on the public health aspects as opposed to just our more typical diagnosis treatment manage, management. Good stuff. Thank you. So Gary, mo we must experience public health. Boy, I think we are all experiencing public health right now. We um, are. We sure are. I think people might be interested, Gary, this has been a passion for you for many years. What's different mm -hmm. now to you? And, and maybe adding to that, how has your master's in public health changed the way you look at optometry? But if you could couch that with a little bit of what you've seen in terms of change, particularly over the last uh, few weeks and months that have, you think, influenced, I hope, in a positive way, more attention being paid to public health mm -hmm. issues. Yes, definitely public health issues have been paid attention to, but I think everyone needs to remember, public health has always been there. It's always in the background. No one's talking about it because things are happening. Things are being taken care of and people feel safe when there is something we do not know, like this time, like uh, the coronavirus and all the things that it's wreaked havoc in, on. And without understanding the science of the virus, then we fall into uh, public health principles. When there is an infectious disease, the principles are which, what we've been seeing, quarantining, figuring out what's the best things to do, like right now knowing masks, but all the confusion that's been there with masks or social distancing, you know, those terms were not in our public consciousness. Uh, they were in other parts of the world, like in Asia, because of the SARS epidemic and because of the experiences people had there, that wasn't necessarily happening in the US pockets of our communities who have relatives or families in other parts of the world, they were more in tune to it. Uh, but this has really changed. And if you look, listen to the news or kind of experience it through your own eyes, back in March and back to now in May, we looked at things very differently. Uh, and even regionally in our different states, we look at it differently. The Northeast got hit particularly bad in the very beginning. So people are more conscious about that. Things are happening in other parts of the country now that uh, we see the surge in the numbers. And, and in fact, maybe that's not a surge and that's just the, the first peak has not happened yet. And so that gives everyone perspective. And then the other thing that's interesting is risk tolerance. Everyone's risk tolerance are different. People's understanding of what's going on is different. So it's put public health in a certain light. And you know, people know the name, Tony Fauci, 
You know, he's been involved in this since the AIDS epidemic. If you read anything about him, and he talks about AIDS ep epidemic and understanding that and how he's educated, and he's been a trusted person in getting information. But the things he still reiterates is there's a lot we do not know. And when we don't know those things, how do we fall back on um, public health principles that we know? And those are started many centuries ago that we're following quarantining and uh, all those things. Hand hygiene, you know, is important. Like, how do we learn how to wash our hands? We learn to wash our hands from our parents and from our schools. So the other thing to really remember is almost all of us are involved in public health. You don't need a public health degree to do public health. I decided to get a public health degree because I, I wanted more information and I wanted to learn and I want to create networks. You know, I'm sure Diane will echo my sentiments. When you go to public health school, you meet other people. And when you meet other people and their passions are in different areas. When I went to public health school, I have friends who were lawyers. I had classmates who were physicians. I had classmates who were physicians from different ethnic and minority groups or caring for different populations that they grew a passion for. And you learn from them. So one thing to learn, one thing I appreciated about optometry school is understanding different perspectives and seeing it in a different light. And so when we are practicing uh, as an optometrist, we tend to dive into that patient perspective, how often we need to pull back and look at the global perspective. And so one thing that's taught me is not only to think of myself as an optometrist, but to, as a healthcare provider and to teach our students and teach my colleagues that you are a healthcare provider and the importance of working collaboratively in teams to instill change. So, the, you know, that's my key lesson I've learned. And then the other thing is to know, um, to instill change, it takes a lot of things. And what, one key model that I constantly remember, you know, it's almost 20 years since I graduated from public health school is a model called the Kingdom model. You know, there is a political stream and you, we know politics are there. And we know, and then there's a technical stream, but the technical stream composes of two parts. Knowing what the problem is, that means you gotta study it, and then figuring out what is my policy that I'm gonna propose to instill change. But all that does not happen until there is a window of opportunity that it goes through. And if we look at um, the protests that have been happening with Black Lives Matter, that is a classic example of what's going on where the political streams and the technical streams are lined up with that window of opportunity. And that's why I'm very hopeful that there'll be change because it takes us all listening in order to get to that next step. So well, we all hope we all hope you're right about that, Gary. And thank you. I and mean, that's a that's really a helpful perspective, I think, for people to have. So Diane, uh, Gary started to talk about sort of short and long term ways we can minimize risk. And perhaps it might be helpful if you could. First of all, we'd love to know why you did your master's in public health, if you care to share that as well. But um, if you could mm -hmm. add to that from a public health perspective, I think generally short term, uh, maybe you can review that, but I hope people are pretty comfortable with what they have to do. Now, I think basic three things that we all hear about, we'd love to hear from a public health standpoint what that sounds like. But perhaps you could also allude to more longer term. Do you see some of these things maintaining? Do we need to continue with this? When do we stop? Those kinds of things might be helpful for people to at least begin to think about. And I think your perspective uh, could be very insightful for us. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when Gary and I had this conversation about getting an MPH, I think it's really sort of two questions is one, why did you get an MPH? But then two, why are you interested in public health? Because I have a lot of conversations with students and colleagues that are like, well, I'm thinking of getting uh, an MPH. And so my first thing, my short answer, and I'm about to have a conversation about this with the, someone tomorrow, is it depends what you wanna do with it if you're, you're thinking of getting an MPH, right? So being interested in public health, honestly, I think we should all be interested in public health. Being healthcare providers, if you're not interested in public health, you're missing the mark in a lot of areas. And you don't have to have another graduate degree to have an understanding and appreciation for public health. So that I think, is cross cutting. Um, but to go for another graduate degree, you know, there's time, there's money. So there's trade offs. Life is all about trade offs. So in thinking about getting an MPH, you know, I think I wanted to make public health a more formalized part of the work that I do. I'm in academia, and the world of academia revolves around the creds. 
You know, why are you qualified to be talking about the things that you're talking about? And so knowing that I wanted to go down that road, having a graduate degree in public health just seemed to make sense. Uh, if you're not necessarily going down that road, then having another graduate degree may not be necessary. Um, and there are other avenues that you can pursue to obtain the public health knowledge that you may be interested in. With respect to short-term, long-term precautions, protocols, you know, I think to just talk a little bit about what, what Gary was talking about, because we don't have all the information and there's still a lot that we're learning, it's really difficult to message that to the public. Um, so much of discussions about public health, but also politics, anything where data is involved is nuanced. And it's really difficult to message that to the public. Um, and then you add another layer to that where it's we don't have all the information that we need. And then there's conflicting information. If you listen to, you know, what maybe the CDC says versus WHO versus Johns Hopkins, you have potentially conflicting information and then the public gets confused. But I think the one thing that has been pretty consistently messaged, although there are also exceptions to that, the three things that people can do, you know, during this pandemic, control what you can control. One, wear a mask. Um, two, wash your hands. And three, stay at least six feet away from other people. You know, and obviously not the people that you live with, but people that you don't live with. Um, and, and those are things that we can control. And the combination of the three, you know, it's a three-legged stool. If you kick one out, then it's not going to be as effective. If you're doing all three of those things in combination, then that will produce the, the most mitigated risk for contracting or spreading COVID. Um, as far as the long term is concerned, you know, I think from a public health perspective, you know, we don't see these types of uh, pandemics all that often, thankfully. So I do think that in some respects, things will go back to somewhat the way they used to be. But uh, so much of that is contingent on a vaccine being developed. You know, the way out of this pandemic is herd immunity. Um, and, you know, herd immunity, if you think of it in the simplest context, is when a certain percentage of the population gets infected. So for this, we would need about 70 to 80 percent of the population to have contracted COVID to develop herd immunity. And you can imagine that would be an incredible loss of life if they were getting infected by normal community spread. But if a vaccine gets developed, that's how you develop herd immunity without having the, the adverse events and loss of life. And so really our way out of this pandemic is for a vaccine to be developed. Um, and then once the vaccine is developed, we can start to ease up on some of those precautions as it's disseminated. Of course, it will be contingent on manufacturing and availability of the vaccine. So it's your sense then that um, until there is a vaccine, we should all be really following those three very important and actually not very invasive or particularly difficult necessarily things to do, but can make such a huge difference. You know, maybe if Eric's there, Eric, buddy, you there for a minute? I wonder if we can get Eric back in with us for a moment. If we can, I was curious to ask him, can you hear us, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, Diane, uh, Dr. Russo was just mentioning about, you know, those three key elements, the mask, it, yes. uh, the wa hand washing and the social distancing. Um, curious, as you've traveled around the country, Eric, and maybe you can compare and contrast a little bit for us optometric practices that you've seen, and then perhaps other businesses that you've seen, and kind of how do you gauge it? Are, are most optometric practices doing a pretty good job in those three areas that you've observed? And how does that compare perhaps to some of the other businesses you've seen? Well, just to recap, uh, what Diane said was uh, the three elements being hand washing, uh, spacing by six feet and wearing a mask, right? Were those the three elements, Diane? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a huge variety uh, between both optometric practices and businesses in general uh, relative to where they are geographically and where they are mentally and in some cases politically. Uh, as I think it's been alluded to in this conversation, and I have to say I've only heard parts of it because I, I was talking with some people here on the street, um, but it, it seems like there's uh, the, the political element is becoming really pronounced, especially with regard to masks. Um, masks have become a very hot point uh, with people in the public and clearly with people in uh, local and national politics. Yeah. And so that has a symbolism of its own. Um, Thank you, Eric. That's yeah, it. I, I, I think ahead, most man. people agree with what Diane said. And, you know, with the, with the exception of the masks being the, the hot button of those three elements, 
uh, I don't think anybody can argue with that. You know, if it's a disease or a uh, you know a virus that that spreads um, from person to person, that being cognizant of spatial distance uh, and um, and those elements is relevant. Uh, the question becomes, how do you how do you mandate it, and what are the differences between Florida, Georgia, uh, Texas? Oklahoma, New Jersey, New York, California, can you have a policy that fits uh, the entire country? And from my perspective, the answer to that is either no, or I haven't seen it yet. Um, because as you adhere to, I think everybody has um, in them a certain element to want to mitigate this, even on all sides of the political spectrum and everywhere else, we want to mitigate. Nobody wants this problem. Uh, but I feel like the struggle is between geography and, you know, does one solution fit all or not? It doesn't seem to be. Uh, and then clearly my question for, for our uh, two guests here is how do you balance the need for public safety with the need for freedom? And I, I would love to know the perspective on that from a high level of education because I certainly don't have it myself. Uh, but I see that the need for that, the need for that notion is certainly out here in the public. How do we balance the desire to be safe with the need for freedom as well? It's a great question and we're gonna throw it to Gary, but Gary, before you answer that, I'll add to Eric's question, which is a really good one. And not only the freedom, but the financial side, right? I mean, we have families that can't feed their families. They're having to make a decision to go to work and take a risk, right? That's yeah. Freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Gary, uh, yeah. not an easy one here, but we'll Thanks give you for the easy question, you know, <laughs> yeah. got the softball yeah. for yeah. you, Gary. Yeah. yeah. Softball, you know, <laughs> it's something, you know, been thinking about, you know, especially um, co-chairing the uh, reopening task force for the college, but also having conversations with Diane and other colleagues. Uh, you know, we can't forget economics. You know, we all have to think of that, you know, and, and the resources that, the resources of things that we're going to add to keep people safe. And so I'm going to take a little, a, a different spin on it. You know, the prevention message is important. Underlying, you know, the, one of the core tenets of public health is prevention. And then the thing with prevention is messaging. How do we message it in a way that makes sense? I remember going to public health school and one class that I really enjoyed and gave me a totally different perspective is, um, how media is a part of messaging. If you could put that out into, in regards to a show and showing those principles, it goes such a long way. And, and I thought that was really powerful uh, when that professor was talking about it. Uh, so the messaging becomes important. And what's been confusing for us in regards to the messaging uh, is the politics behind it and also the shortage of PPE in the very beginning that put in people's minds that masks weren't important and that's created what's happening now and you, you can see some of our public health um, professionals in the federal government have stated that that was an error in terms of what happened so that becomes important and the other thing is you know when it comes to responsibility the government has responsibility both federal state and local organizations have a responsibility how do we balance that? We need to reopen. We understand that, but there are things that we can do to help. You know, understanding what's going on. Like, uh, you know, one thing that makes this virus very different is not just the sneezing or the coughing that has these uh, viral particles in the air. It's the micro droplets that are even what is uh, her what is harming people the most, and those linger. And so ventilation becomes important. So that's, that's what I mean, like there are organizational responsibilities and administrative controls, things that we can take care of the building, things that we can limit in stores. So I know going to different places, everyone has different risk tolerances, but it's the understanding that if I do my part as an organization, I'm protecting others. And if people do their part, they're protecting others as well. So there is organizational controls that need to be there that trust that the public has, but then there is the social trust that needs to be developed. So you got your organization responsibility and you got individual responsibility to think about that. And so how do we develop that social trust? And I think that's where we are hitting a roadblock. So 
creating prevention messages help and to remind people when you wear a mask, when you social distance, when you wash your hands, you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting others. And when you protect others, you protect other people. So it's very cyclical in terms of what's going on because what organizationally, what you do with your staff, you know, that will be translated into the community. If they do the same thing, then everybody benefits. So how do we kind of create that message? And right now there's a lot of politics involved in that, but how do we get above that and develop this social trust that can help so many people? Social trust right, is such Gary. a critical importance. Can I follow on that, uh, Howard? Please, yes. um, please, Eric, I, yeah. I think that, you know, from my experience in, in traveling the last six weeks, I, I see all of what you're talking about. And I think there's a deep desire for people to want to contribute to the safety of everybody uh, through those, through that education. And as you say, messaging about the hand washing. If the masks are, are, are helpful, then great, then masks. Uh, but on a volunteer basis and with those risk tolerances that you referenced in mind, like, uh, I didn't hear you reference legislation or executive orders, and to me, that's public order address those elements, which I completely agree with you. Like, why not try to be part of the solution uh, instead of part of the problem if we can demonstrate that that's that? So that's all the messaging. But where in public policy, in terms of legislation or executive order, with this myriad of, of uh, variables of infection rate, death rate, hospitalization rate, mm -hmm. Uh, and as you say, tolerances in different areas um, or even religious belief. Uh, you yes. know, some people will, will, will carry and say, I am OK and I trust and have faith that uh, I'm not either carrying or spreading this disease and I need to go about my business. H how do you blend all those things? And I'm asking sincerely. So, yeah, and that's the hard thing because it's about ideology. Political ideology has a lot to do with this. And then the, um, you know, some of the core beliefs in this country is about freedom. You know, we're not China, we're not Asia, and we're especially not China where, uh, you know, it's a, you know, a different political ideology when the government says you have to do something, everyone has to comply. And if you notice in the very beginning, even when um, all these orders to stay home, a lot of states said, you, you know, they, these were advisories, these weren't orders and, you know, and there's a difference there, you know, we, we, you know, the core tenets of individualism and, and freedom is very important in this country. So we cannot move people just by legislation. You know, then what, what do you do when you legislate, when, whenever there's a legislation people don't follow, there is consequences. Well, what type of consequences are we going to do? And so it's a, it's a tricky thing. So if we, r rather than doing that and penalize people, if we develop campaigns to, to instill social trust in order to have people complying with these core things that we know that will help, I think we'll go further into solving the issues. Because if you think about all the other issues we've been talking about, systemic racism, we talk about, you know, seatbelt laws, we talk about gun control, you know, just purely legislation is not going to get us there because What's going to happen is there are going to be more debates and we're not going to lead anywhere. So we do something a little different and think about social trust, getting enough out there for people to see. There are a lot of videos out there, especially one called Schlerwin Imaging, where you can see from mass the, the way the particles are spread. Those things can help. So if we, if we solicit or elicit people's um, higher senses of wanting to contribute and help others, maybe we'll get to a better place. And I know it's never going to be 100%. No matter what we do, even if we legislate, people may not necessarily do the things that we, uh, we hope that they will do. But one thing I learned, the other thing that sticked in my mind when I went to public health school was from a uh, commissioner of health in a county of New York. He came to speak, and that's the beauty of Harvard. When they have people speak, they, they have people come back and speak who've done things. And you see how they are learning things, the theoretical things, and putting it into practice. One thing he said that I never forget is, you know, in hu human nature, we can only remember a cer certain amount of things. So he always said, remember this, Socko. 
what is the single overlying communicating objective that you want people to know? You know, with the COVID-19, there's so much going on. So what's the SACO in this? The SACO is wear your mask. You, we've seen a lot in terms of what's happening in other countries. What mitigates risk is masks. If you forget everything else, wear masks. So even if you have a person coming in not wearing masks, if you're wearing a mask, you're safe. You're safer than not. So with all this in mind, with the independence that this country, uh, it, uh, this country holds very dear, we hope that they will wear a mask, but at least if other people wear a mask, we would be safer. And then, you know, the second thing, hand hygiene, and then the third thing, social distancing. We're not always going to be perfect. We all walk down the street and some people wear masks, some people don't. Uh, how do we balance all that? And nothing is going to be zero risk. If we layer as many defense mechanisms as we can, we will be in a better place. I hope that that helps. Yeah, no, Gary, that's great. Eric, I'm going to jump in for just a minute because I want to go over to Diane. But Gary, thank you. A lot of really good information there. Diane, I had two things for you. One, and perhaps it's a naive question, but not being a master's in public health like you, I'm going to throw this out to you. Is it common in things that you've seen to have politics be so influential in public health crises? And I see you smiling, so it's probably a very naive question, but I'll throw it to you. Is this very typical? I mean, politics often, I assume play a big role. Can you just speak to that at all? And then the second part of the question, if you wouldn't mind, because I'd love as we start to wind down the interview to provide some positives here. I'm curious as to your perspective about the future, your optimism about the future of particularly in, op in the optometric space. But if you could start a little bit of education, perhaps for me, <laughs> typically politics do play a role, I presume. Uh Yes, <laughs> is, the, is the short <laughs> answer. Uh, so, you know, it's funny. I, I was just talking to Gary and telling this story. So, you know, when you study public health and you're in a program with other people studying public health, it tends to be very passion driven. You know, everyone has a mission and a commitment to the general overall public good. Many people feel that healthcare is a right, uh, which, you know, as far as the U.S. is concerned, it is not considered a right legally. You know, there's sort of the moral definition of a right and the legal definition. Legally, it's not considered a right. Um, and that's why there are access to care issues. So, uh, so many people are, are driven by that passion and that mission and that altruism. And I remember uh, I was having dinner with um, uh, a legislator from England one of the professors at the Kennedy School and the dean of the Kennedy School at Harvard and then a couple other Kennedy School students. So they're all sort of studying public policy. I'm studying health policy. And I made a comment <laughs> at the time that was sort of a throwaway comment. Well, you know, most of the faculty at the School of Public Health are bleeding hearts, bleeding heart liberals or something like that. And the dean sort of was taken aback, like, well, they're not supposed to make that known to you. It shouldn't be so obvious. And I just thought, well, I mean, that's probably my perception, but I just thought, like, I don't know, that level of compassion and empathy goes hand in hand with public health. You know, I don't, in my own experience, I didn't go to school with many people studying public health so that they can be particularly savvy and crafty with taking health care away from people. <laughs> you know, it's, it's generally driven by wanting to care for people, leading with empathy. Um, but so much of that is rooted in ideology, political ideology, what you think the role of government should be, your philosophy. You know, this goes back to, you know, philosophers, I talk about this with my husband, like John Locke and John Stuart Mill, you know, what do you think the role of government is and, and what do you think the meaning of, of life is? And, and so much of that is foundational to how you view the world and what you think other people deserve. Right? It's probably a little bit more clear cut than what you think you deserve, but it's what you think other people deserve and have a right to. So you cannot talk about public health or policy without having politics involved because politics is what shapes how we view the world. And when it comes to government, which is such a hot button issue in the US, what you think the role of government needs to be. Um, and yeah. so uh, there was another uh, experience that I had at the very beginning of, of the pandemic. I was in New York for continuing education in mid-March. And there was this very 
it, will it happen? Won't it happen? And my husband's telling me, I don't think you should go. And I'm like, it's fine. They're still having it. I'm going to go. I'm going to get on an Amtrak train for four hours and then go stay in a stranger's apartment that's an Airbnb and then go sit in a lecture hall with 100 people. Um, and I had Broadway tickets both nights that I was there. So Wednesday night, I went to see West Side Story. Lovely. Packed. Not, a, not an empty seat in the house. And then the second night I had seats for Dear Evan Hansen and Broadway closed down. And the reality is if they hadn't, I would have gone. And like, I'm, you know, an educated with it person, but sometimes, you know, government plays the role of protecting you from yourself. In my opinion, that's the way I view it. So <laughs> I probably- well, That's a, that's a very positive. <laughs> I was to say, that's a very positive spin uh, to put on it. Yeah. And we appreciate that. Okay. Uh, so, so I think they help me protect me from myself. But as far as to get to your second question, the future, you know, being optimistic, I'm probably maybe a little bit more pessimistic than Gary is in this moment. But you have to, I have to maintain optimism. I mean, if you don't, you know, you're in for a bumpy ride. And so I do believe that things get better. I do believe that with time we make progress. It's not nearly as quick as some of us would like, as perhaps I would like, but I do believe that we are moving forward and making progress and I hold on to that. Thank you guys so much. Stay with us for a minute. Eric has a special guest who's gonna join us. Eric, are you there, buddy? Um, I know you got a special guest that's joining us from Southwest Missouri, uh, Courtney Varner. So we're gonna turn it over to you. We'd love to hear from Courtney from Dr. Steve Rice's office. Yeah, terrific. Uh, is Courtney on the line? Yes, she is. There's, there she is. How are you, Courtney? Good. How are you? Terrific. I, you know, I had planned to be there uh, today with you, and uh, you know, the, the travel was not so easy to Springfield, Missouri today. So I'm glad that we're still able to connect. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious. What, and by the way, by way of introduction, you are the Vision Source representative for Southwest Missouri. You work at. Uh, Dr. Steve Rice's Vision Clinic, but you also serve the entire Vision Source community in Southwest Missouri. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Can, can you describe uh, what your position is there and how this entire conversation that we're having is uh, is impacting your work? Sure, absolutely. Um, so for Dr. Rice's office at the Vision Clinic, um, I'm the director of operations. We have five locations, 85 staff members, uh, 12 doctors, so we have a pretty large practice here, so it takes a lot of things to, to keep everything running. So I tend to do a lot of the business side, logistical side of just keep keeping things together and moving us forward, whatever whatever happens. And, and as you've had guidelines and, and this public policy conversation, which I believe you've been privy to over the last uh, 30 or 40 minutes, what stands out in terms of the, the the hot topics that are relevant to that huge flow of eye care that's happening right in the heart of our country. You know, the biggest things I kept going back to is um, just the fact that we've always in Southwest Missouri, our region and our practice here at the Vision Clinic, we have always been great at embracing change. And that's been something that we've had to do a, a lot of recently. Um, and with Dr. Steve Rice as our leader, he's also a vision source administrator. So he does a phenomenal job of keeping us on the leading edge of anything going on. Um, you know, our connections with vision source, they have been a huge support through this, just having people to, to go over best practice ideas and figure out where we go next from there. Um, but positivity is another thing that came what, to mind. What about the public policy? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I'm in a noisy spot. I apologize. Uh, the public policy side, I know you guys are guided very well by your organization and by the, the leadership within your practice because it's A+. Plus. We can take that as a, as a granted. When you have to deal with either the state of Missouri or uh, the federal government or the, the public policy that's out there around closures, masks, separation, spatial uh, issues, uh, what is it that you're taking from those cues uh, is there anything that you're leaving aside and saying that this doesn't work for our business or how do you balance what you're being given with what you actually have to do? I guess. You know, we've, we've followed our, our Green County Health Department and the CDC. Those are the two main sources that we're staying on top of um, in Tan Taney County, the other counties that we have offices in. We're following those very close um, and taking those things seriously for our patients. 
obviously um, the governors in different states are making different decisions. Um, so as things have happened just recently here, uh, we opened up the beginning of May with very specific protocols, the masks, the social distancing, um, scheduling only by appointment, people sitting in their cars until they were actually, until it was actually time to see the doctor, those type of things. And, and where we're at in Southwest Missouri, um, just a couple weeks ago, the governor made another change for phase two. So out in the public, um, there, there's not as much mask wearing and things like that right now. So that's the first time that we started experiencing that in the office um, with patients starting to come in. You know, for the most part, they appreciate that we're keeping them safe and that we're all wearing our mask um, and we're doing the things that we need to do to protect them and ourselves. But more recently, since those things have changed from the government changes, we've had more questions about, well, you know, we don't have to wear masks anymore. So we're continuing to follow our Greene County Health Department and the CDC because in our profession, we can't social distance. So that's been something that has we've held on to and tried to explain to them that, you know, we're, we're still requiring the mask here for our organization and for your protection because it, we're in a little bit different spot in healthcare. We can't always social distance. We can't do some of the things you can do when you're out in the public. Yeah, those are some great points, Courtney. I, I want to say thank you for that. I, I just, if I could add, um, and I hope you uh, appreciate it in the way this is trying to be delivered, but I think we have realized uh, many things through this pandemic. But one of the things we've realized is the critical importance of our staff, the role that they play, the front lines that they really have control over and they are responsible for. And I, I just want to say, because we have you here, and I'm sure my colleagues on the line would agree, we thank all of you for what you do every single day. Perhaps there are times we take it for granted because we're in the exam room, we're doing the things that we do. But I think you know it has really come to bear for us and, and has been just dramatic to see the role that you all play, the important role that you all play, uh, your bravery being out there on the front lines every day. And I think if there's a silver lining, and we hope there'll be many silver linings that come from this, uh, certainly within optometry, the appreciation for what you do, what the people you represent do, and the leadership that you have shown in this area, particularly with Vision Source. I can only imagine that being part of an alliance and having that support, and you mentioned it, is so critical, particularly through a time like this. But I want to say on behalf of the, of the doctors, Thank you, Courtney, as a representative of our staff and the members of our staff and the critical role you play. We could not do it without you. And particularly now we recognize that. So thank you. Thank you for representing so well. And thank you for what you continue to do to make our practices successful. Thank you. You bet. Eric, I don't think we can hear you very well, buddy. So. I'll tell you what I'm going to say. First of all, I hope we can bring all our guests back for just a moment. I want to say thank you so much to all of our guests today. You have enlightened all of us and helped us so much to understand what is a very difficult and trying time to understand. I hope everyone appreciates how lucky I am to be at New England College of Optometry and have two many amazing people, but two in particular today who have helped us navigate through this. You guys are amazing. Not only have you helped New England College of Optometry, you helped people across the country. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the support you continue to give on behalf of Eric and I. I am so lucky that I get to work with you guys every day. And I know all those other schools that are watching are very jealous. Ha ha. But no, we appreciate everything you guys continue to do. So uh, with that, as we uh, wind down the show, we want to make sure to continue with our friend, Dr. John Rampakis, who always adds a little bit to the end of this show. We want to thank John for that over these past 11 weeks. And now it's time once again for something to think about. Thank you, Howard. Who knew it would take a pandemic to help us understand that the interactions and intersections of public health and optometry would be an integral part of our profession's future? The COVID-19 public health emergency has exposed many shortcomings of the US healthcare system as we become aware. We've also learned that the more information any society has, the better decisions it can make. For example, if we had had more testing earlier on in the phases of the pandemic, maybe we could have avoided the crippling effects that shutting down the economy has had on all of us. On the news today, it was reported that cases in the U.S. were re underreported by over 80 times. That's pretty significant. Case in point, 
Optometry is 45,000 people strong. We're on the front lines. In fact, we're many, many times, we are the primary healthcare provider or somebody's first point of entry into the healthcare system. Couldn't have optometry been there? Shouldn't have optometry been there to test for COVID-19? If optometry really wants to be an integral part of the medical community, then we have to be visible on those front lines. Ergo, why aren't we doing more testing of COVID-19 in optometric practices nationwide? We need to partner with our leadership on the national and state levels and our state boards to make sure that optometry is really part of the public health equation. Look, I don't have an MPH, but I do have an MCS, which is a master's in common sense. And it tells me if my pharmacist at the local CVS or Walgreens can test for COVID, then so can your local optometrist. Look, COVID-19 has identified a gap. Maybe we should call it an opportunity, a huge opportunity for us to be a more integrated part of the public health system and really be a primary care profession. It's up to each and every one of us to do our own part to help fill that gap. I'm John Rampakis, and that's something to think about. Thanks for watching Inside Vision. To receive updates about our programming, click subscribe.